Life is not easy in the Peruvian Andes. The air is thin, the terrain is unforgiving, and the temperature fluctuates between woolly hats and tank tops every 12 hours. But for many people, the real challenge is the water supply. Now, water isn't exactly scarce. Annual rainfall in Moraz is about 740 millimetres, putting it somewhere in between Edinburgh and Cardiff, two cities not exactly known for their dry weather. The issue is distribution. Western Peru experiences extreme wet and dry seasons. So for six months of the year, communities have to survive on about 0.4 millimetres of rainfall per day. In spite of this, the mountains have been a hotspot for human civilization since before the Incas, and are home to more than a quarter of a million people today. So how do they do it? In a word, glaciers. Huge, slow-moving rivers of ice, fed by snowfall high up in the mountains. Glacial melt provides a constant source of water throughout the year, and acts as a vital buffer for river levels in the dry season. Unfortunately, this icy reservoir is no longer stable. The ice-covered area of the Peruvian Andes has decreased by about 40% over the last 80 years, driven primarily by a steep rise in air temperatures. This is obviously concerning for the people who rely on tropical glaciers for water, agriculture and electricity. But the more immediate effects of climate change are something you might not expect. The rivers are turning toxic. To understand why these rivers are changing, we need to talk a little about the glaciers that feed them. Glaciers are renowned for their ability to shape mountains. As the ice winds its way across a landscape, it picks up rocks, boulders and pebbles and essentially smashes them against each other. This creates smaller and smaller particles until you end up with glacial flour. Rock dust so fine you can fit around 50 particles in a single grain of sand. And this is where the chemistry starts to come in because when you grind a slab of bedrock into particles that are only a few microns wide, you get a huge area of exposed atoms. And the more atoms you expose, the more likely it is that chemical reactions will take place. Which specific reactions take place underneath a glacier will depend upon a few factors, like which minerals make up the bedrock. One really common example is the hydrolysis of carbonates. Carbonates are the primary mineral found in a lot of sedimentary rocks, including limestone and dolomite which are found pretty much all over the world. Hydrolysis is just a combination of the words hydro, meaning water, and lysis, meaning breaking apart. So carbonate hydrolysis is just the process of splitting up carbonates with water. Simple. Often, the products of one reaction will drive other secondary reactions. For instance, carbonate hydrolysis produces a carbonate ion, which can react with water to produce carbon dioxide. This, in turn, can react with another common group of minerals known as feldspars. Similarly, if there is oxygen in the water and a sulfur-containing mineral such as pyrite, or fool's gold, in the rock, then the oxygen and sulfur can recombine to make sulfuric acid. This acid will then be quickly used up by another reaction. Many of these reactions are quite slow. After all, rocks are pretty tough to crack, but they can be massively sped up by subglacial microorganisms tiny creatures that live under glaciers and can often use chemicals like sulfur and iron to produce their energy. The biological and chemical reactions that take place under glaciers release a ton of nutrients into the water, including nitrogen, silicon and iron. These are carried downstream by glacial rivers, supporting aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, including us humans and our farms. But what happens when we add climate change into the picture? If the glaciers shrink, then do these chemical reactions stop happening altogether? Or do they just change? This is Laguna Shyap. It's a medium-sized proglacial lake in the Peruvian Cordillera Blanca, and it used to look very different. I was the postdoctoral research associate on the Cascada project. This was investigating the acidification of glacial rivers within the Peruvian Cordillera Blanca. The project started in 2019, after some local communities had reported that a number of pristine glacial rivers had turned toxic over the last couple of decades. It's not difficult to see which rivers have been affected. The water in this area typically turns a vivid green, and then there are lots of rusty looking orange deposits around the riverbank. Measurements of water quality show that the pH of the rivers dropped from a neutral value of about 7 to around about 3, which is roughly the same as grapefruit juice. We also found dangerously high levels of a number of metals, including iron, manganese and lead. We do have some idea how this can happen. As I mentioned earlier, when water and oxygen come into contact with exposed sulphide minerals such as pyrite, it can produce sulfuric acid. Normally, this isn't a big deal, because the reaction takes place very slowly and the products are used up relatively quickly. 
But if something causes this process to take place more rapidly, the sulfuric acid will start to build up. This then sets off a positive feedback loop, as another byproduct of the oxidation reaction, iron 3, will stick around in acidic solutions and can drive even more sulfide oxidation. Before long, the water will become acidic enough to drive secondary reactions that leach heavy metals from the rock. This process is known as acid rock drainage and is normally associated with abandoned metal and coal mines. But why is it only appearing in glaciers now? And why only certain glaciers? We initially thought that the acidification was taking place in all of the freshly exposed rock above the laguna, which used to be covered by the glacier. However, when we got to the glacier itself, we realised that the water coming out had already been acidified. This means that something had kick-started the oxidation reaction within the glacier itself. Using digital elevation models, we were able to compare the movement of Shyap Glacier with a nearby glacier that hadn't turned acidic. The tongue of Shyap, that is the front part of the glacier, is quite thin and very slow moving. Slow moving ice is more stable, which allows permanent drainage channels to form within the ice, some of which will be connected to the surface. We think that this stable drainage system is allowing more oxygen into the subglacial environment, resulting in runaway acidification. The tongue of the glacier used to run all the way down to the laguna. Back then, the ice would have been moving much more quickly due to the steepness of the slope. Fast moving ice is much less stable, therefore it's unlikely the same kind of drainage systems could have developed. There are still many things we don't know about the acidification processes taking place in the Cordillera Blanca. We don't know, for instance, if the oxidation reaction is entirely chemical, or if the influx of oxygen has allowed aerobic bacteria to grow under the glaciers. One study in 2015 detected sulfur oxidizing bacteria in the acidified rivers, so it seems like a reasonable guess. But the priority right now is very much focused downstream, where more than 200,000 people are suddenly faced with the threat of poisoned water sources and toxic crops. At least four of the rivers investigated by the Cascada project have turned acidic so far. All of them contain levels of iron, aluminium and manganese that are well above the maximum safe limits for drinking water set by the World Health Organization, some by as much as 100 times. Furthermore, recent work suggests that primary producers, like plants and algae, aren't able to photosynthesize in these rivers, which might not sound like a big deal, but if there's no food at the start of the food chain, then this has knock-on effects for every other species that might normally live in the water. Community groups are currently trialling artificial wetlands as a way to mitigate the effects of acidification. The idea is that certain plants will take up the excess metals or produce compounds that neutralise the acid. Digging these wetlands is a huge amount of work relative to the size of the rivers, but it's a step in the right direction. For all we know, it might be the first step en route to the future of water treatment. Acid rock drainage might sound like something out of science fiction, but it will probably affect more of us than we think. There are natural sources of ARD all over the world, and a recent study found that the rate of acidification is strongly tied to climate, even in regions with no glacial coverage. And that, I think, says a lot about how vastly complicated and interconnected the natural world really is. Special thanks to the GW4 Fresh College of Doctoral Training for supporting this video, and to Simon Clark for all of his time advising, editing and producing it. Simon is a professional science communicator, so if you'd like to see more videos of this style, then I'll leave a link to his channel in the description. Otherwise, if you'd like to see more videos about glaciology, then I've got a new one coming up about physical erosion processes, so be sure to check back on this channel in a few weeks.